All right, we've just um, had several uh, recorded lectures on the light reactions in Chapter 7. And, um, and so if we kind of step back and look at the chlorophyll, the chloroplast and its um, functions, um, just to remind us, we have all of those light reactions taking place in the thylakoids. Uh, we saw where water was an input um, to, as a source of electrons to replace electrons that were excited and lost from P680 in, the, in photosystem 2. And when water molecules, um, when those uh, electrons are donated to P680 chlorophyll A, then oxygen is a product. Um, through the light harvesting, um, sorry, through the light reactions, the uh, outputs that are then used by the Calvin cycle are NADPH and ATP. Um, so this is a good, um, you know, sort of moment to step back and look at the big picture as we then start to look at chapter 8, which covers the processes associated with the Calvin cycle and CO2 fixation. So just as a reminder, we can see that uh, carbon dioxide is an input, and this is coming from the atmosphere into the leaves, and that other inputs include ATP and NADPH, which are products of the light reactions. So even though we refer to the Calvin cycle as light independent reactions, they are actually dependent on the light reactions, which makes, uh, which, so to clarify, the Calvin cycles do not actually run without um, light, without the input of ATP and NADPH. The output is um, here the sugars, that are going to then result in the synthesis of sucrose, which is going to circulate through phloem throughout the plant, depending on where it's needed, uh, as starch for storage, whether that's in chloroplasts or in roots or in the leaves, and as glucose or fructose. Fructose uh, is the, the sugar form in fruit. Um, and possibly also used like glucose for metabolism to make ATP as a result of cellular respiration. So we have lots of um, potential uh, uses for the product of the Calvin cycle. All right, so the rem uh, also remember that the Calvin cycle occurs in the stroma. And so we'll be looking at the various intermediates that are parts of the Calvin cycle as well as the enzymes that help regulate. The, um, the Calvin cycle. All right, so that brings us to um, a view of the leaf, just to, re to review here the leaf cross-section, because this is uh, where carbon dioxide enters. Down here, we're looking at carbon dioxide as the red dots here. And carbon dioxide enters through stomata, or stom a single stoma or a stomate uh, and diffuses towards the mesophyll cells. Here are the our mesophyll cells containing chloroplasts where these light, uh, light reactions have been occurring. So what you want to make sure that you can do is trace a CO2 molecule from the atmosphere to the stroma of the, within chloroplasts in mesophyll cells. Um, and so in doing that tracing, you're going to um, trace chlorophyll, or sorry, carbon dioxide uh, into the substomodal space here uh, across the cell wall of the mesophyll cell and uh, across the cell membrane, the plasma membrane of the mesophyll cell, into the cytoplasm, and then across the outer and inner uh, membranes of the chloropl chloroplast to all the way to the stroma. So uh, then the question is, uh, that we want to make sure we understand, is what drives CO2 um, diffusion? into the chloroplasts from the atmosphere, chloroplasts from the atmosphere. And so if you go way back to chapter one when we talked about um, Fick's first law, it is a concentration gradient of CO2 from the external atmosphere 
to the uh, interior of the chloroplast with stroma. Or we could also refer to that as a, um, as a chemical potential gradient, because a concentration gradient reflects a chemical potential gradient. Um, since carbon dioxide is, is um, hydrophobic, in other words, it doesn't have, the oxygens have um, equal pull on the electrons, so it's not a polar molecule, it's a nonpolar molecule. These can diffuse across phospholipid, um, the phospholipid bilayer of the mesophyll plasma membrane without any sort of um, transport protein. Another thing to, to keep in mind um, with regard to diffusion is the question, uh, what keeps the concentration of CO2 low at, in the stroma? What keeps the concentration of carbon dioxide low in the stroma? And the answer there is the ongoing fixation of CO2 in the Calvin cycle which means that CO2 is um, becoming attached or bonded to a CO2 acceptor. Now in our uh, list of video clips that are uh, posted on Blackboard, this is one of the video clips that's posted to review the, di the three different stages of the Calvin cycle and to see uh, how many carbon dioxides are coming in and, and as, as a result how many um, three phosphoglycerates are produced uh, and so on through the cycle so that you can keep track of some of the balance between the numbers of CO2, ATP used, uh, NADPH used, and um, the CO2 acceptor RUBP, ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, that's produced or regenerated. So make sure you use this as a tool to, to review those steps and then we'll look at the details here um, as we go through um, the diagram that you're seeing. Now first of all we're looking at the Calvin cycle and you can see that there's a cycling of intermediates all the way around from uh, a series of reactions and here's where we see carbon dioxide uh, entering the, car the Calvin cycle. So CO2 is going to be consumed uh, in this first stage um, which is called carboxylation. The carboxylation stage which is also referred to as CO2 fixation meaning that the CO2 is becoming um, fixed to a CO2 acceptor, which is over here, CO2 acceptor. And the CO2 acceptor is ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, or uh, abbreviated RUBP. Okay. Now, the numbers can get quite confusing when we're looking here initially. Um, so you're going to mainly be paying attention to the ratios of these numbers. Uh, you can see, for example, that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the amount of ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate and the amount of carbon dioxide. So for every RUBP, there is one CO2 that gets fixed with it. For every CO2 that enters the cycle, there are the, um, the, the product of carboxylation is uh, two times the amount of three phosphoglycerates or three PGAs, which is the abbreviation. Um, so let's say we're looking at one CO2 entering. It gets fixed by one ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. And we can see the molecular structure over here, uh, which is a five-carbon molecule. And of course, CO2 is a, a one-carbon molecule. So to um, fix one carbon molecule to five carbon molecule, we end up <coughs> right here, kind of left out of the figure, with a six carbon unstable intermediate. Okay, and, um, and of course if there are six CO2s entering, then there'll be six of these, but we're just trying to follow, um, you know, keep track of the ratios here. This one six carbon unstable intermediate then is, because it's unstable, it's going to immediately split into two times that amount. So if we have one unstable carbon intermediate with six carbons in it, um, then we end up with two three phosphoglycerates. So it's essentially like we take a five carbon molecule plus a one carbon molecule equals a six carbon molecule, and then that gets divided into two to produce two, um, two different three carbon molecules. Two, okay. 
So that was um, the carboxylation stage. And so the inputs are RUBP and CO2, and the outputs, or the, the product, is um, 3PGA. Then 3PGA becomes the reactant in the next stage, so we can kind of divide this figure here now. Um, the next stage is called reduction, the reduction stage. And this, uh, this includes ATP phosphorylation and NADPH um, oxidation, I should say, or NADPH is going to be reducing uh, one of the intermediates here. So it includes both of these um, steps, even though we it's called the reduction stage. So that stage continues to this point right here, just to kind of divide the figure up a bit. So 3-phosphoglycerate enters the, re the reduction stage. Here's that first step where for each 3-phosphoglycerate that enters the reduction stage, it is phosphorylated by one ATP. So if 12 3-PGAs enter the reduction stage, then 12 ATP are consumed. Um, and by becoming phosphorylated, we're looking at 3-PGA up here, 3-carbon molecule with one phosphorus group. And when it gets phosphorylated by ATP, then we add another phosphorus group to it. So now it becomes 1,3-bis-phosphoglycerate or 1,3-BPGA. Okay, and still we're looking at a 1 to 1 ratio here between the reactant and the product in that phosphorylation step. The next step is the reduction, the actual reduction step where 1,3-bisphosphorylate is, um, bisphosphoglycerate rather, is um, going to be reduced by NADPH. Again, there's a 1 to 1 ratio between the reactant and the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate the the and the NADPH. And when it's reduced, it also loses uh, that, that phosphate group that was added. And now we're still with a three carbon molecule, just like we were, were up here. Um, but we're back to one phosphorus group here, and just a reshuffling of carbon and oxygens. So this is the ultimate um, product here, is the glyceraldehyde three phosphate, and we abbreviate that as G3P. And once again, there's a one-to-one -one relationship, or ratio rather, between the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate that is a reactant in that reduction step and the product, the, three, the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So there's an equal number of each of the, of the product and the reactant in this as well. Uh, likewise, there's an equal number of NADPHs that were used in that reduction step. All right, and now we're at the, th the last stage, the third stage of the Calvin cycle. Uh, where we can see that G3P has, is the product of the reduction stage, and um, G3P is then going to enter the regeneration stage. So this is the RUBP regeneration, or just regeneration stage of the Calvin cycle. And we're sort of boxing these so that we can reference them if we need to. Okay, so just kind of looking at the numbers here, it takes, even though we ha we're looking at six carbon dioxides coming through and producing 12 glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates, uh, if we see, we, we could back this down to three, three carbon dioxides coming through the system and producing six G3Ps, um, and in that case, um, for for every three CO2s that enter the cycle, six G3Ps are produced, one can be exported, and five have to move on into the regeneration stage. Because your figure shows these numbers all doubled, we're going to kind of stay consistent with that so that we don't get confused. So for every six carbon dioxides that enter the Calvin cycle, 12 G3Ps are produced, Two of them can be exported, which you see here, and 10 move on into the regeneration stage. So if we do a little multiplication, we see with the 10 that moves into the regeneration stage, we have a total of 30 carbons here, and the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, the 10 of those, are going to undergo a recombination here to form here another, you can see there's still 30 carbons, um, to form six 5-carbon molecules. 
So we'll continue with that in the next, uh, with the regeneration stage in the next video clip.